Hey, it's Derek. I'm the Millwright guy. I'm going to show you guys how to use the JTEC laser extension within Inkscape to generate a laser G code file so you can run our laser. All right, you see that I have the Millwright logo here. And you notice that the color is already filled in. You don't need that for what you're about to do. What I'd recommend here is that you highlight everything, hit Control Shift F, and that's going to bring up the Inkscape fill and stroke tool. I'm on the fill tab. I'm going to hit X. I'll go ahead and close that out. Alternatively, if you want to bring up fill and stroke, you can just go to object fill and stroke. Now, I knew I did not need to do that on this particular file, but I wanted to show you this because a lot of times you're looking for something to engrave and you pull something off the internet that's an SVG, a scalable vector graphic. And a lot of times that file was not designed to be run on a laser or for mechanically engraving. A lot of times it was just meant to look pretty. And it will have all kind of extra little vector lines in here. So what you can do is highlight everything and go over to fill and stroke, get rid of all that, just to look in there and make sure that there's no additional uh, vector line stuff going on it's going to mess you up so moving on to get the extension and when I say the extension I mean I go to my extension menu generate laser g-code the JTEC photonics laser tool to get this functionality installed into Inkscape you need to go over to the JTEC photonics page you could just do a Google search for JTEC Inkscape laser plugin and you'll find it. It will describe to you how to download that file, download this extension as they call it, and put it into your Inkscape folder. I'm not going to go into it, but it's pretty simple. You download the file, you park it in your Inkscape folder, you restart Inkscape, and you'll find it there under your extensions menu. So here's how you actually do it. All right, you will go to well, actually, first, you're going to highlight the entire design that you want to laze. So you're going to go to Extensions, Generate Laser G-Code, JTEC Photonics Laser Tool. Here you see some parameters that are already set. These may not be here by default, so you need to make sure they get in there. Laser On Command should be M3. Laser Off Command should be M5. Now, M3 and M03 is essentially the same thing, so don't get wrapped around that. Just... M03, M05. Your travel speed, and I gotta tell you, I find this a little bit of an odd implementation of a rapid movement. I'm gonna get a little off topic to explain what I mean here. Normally, when you're machining a feature, say you're doing this eye, and you're machining along this vector path, and your machine finishes what it needs to do here, it's going to lift the tool up if you're using a mechanical cutter, or in this case, it's going to turn the laser off, and it's going to rapid traverse over here to this feature or some other nearby feature and start machining. Uh, either get back into the stock with a mechanical tool or turn the laser back on and resume machining. What this does instead is use G1, so you need to specify the feed rate. That's what this is. Don't get too confused by everything I just said. Know that just this speed or this figure here is how fast it's going to move from one feature to the other when it's not lazing, when it's just traveling from one point to another. And that is in the units specified here. I like to work in millimeters. If you guys don't, I highly suggest you get used to it. It's uh, just easier to design and do everything working in millimeters. So here I'm doing this in 3,500 millimeters per minute because I have millimeters selected from this drop down. Your laser speed is how fast it is moving along as it actually is lasing into this feature. Your laser power is going to be how intense the laser is actually burning. Now, with our controllers and the JTEC Photonics lasers that you get from us, you will have 0 to 12,000 intensity, 12,000 being the maximum intensity that it can output. 
zero is going to be completely off. Now you should know here that it's not going to come off if you just were to put in, or excuse me, it's not going to come on at all if you just put a value of say 100. There's a certain figure for intensity that you have to have as a minimum for that laser to come on. And it's quite low, but just know if you try and say S100, it's probably not even going to come on at all. All right, here with 11,000 and a laser speed of 500, I'm going to get a pretty good burn into most wood materials that I'm going to laze. You could increase this to say 2,000 or 2,500, and you could move this around closer to 12,000. You could back it down. I suggest that you play with those two parameters in some scrap material to see what works best for your project and your material. Moving on, the power on delay is going to be, uh, I'll explain this uh, with an example. Let's say I wanted to actually cut out this eye from a thin piece of material. That power on delay is going to be how long it actually dwells when it first kicks that laser on. And that's useful if you actually want to begin penetrating through a material. I don't use that very often with the JTEC Photonics laser system, but if that was your goal is to cut through the material all the way, that might be something that you want to consider playing with uh, to get the best effect. Now your passes is going to be, uh, as it implies, just how many times it goes across this particular vector line. The pass depth is going to be how far it drops the z-axis down with each successive pass. Now this is important, going back to the concept of cutting something out. Let's say that you've got a five millimeter thick piece of balsa, for example, that you want to cut all the way through. You're probably not going to do that in just one pass, so you're going to take multiple passes at the material. Well, the, the way that a laser works is there is an ideal focal distance, and that is the distance between your lens and the material that is being lased. And when I say the material being lased, I mean the impact point on that material that you're lasing. So if you've got a five millimeter thick piece of stock, and you want to take multiple passes to cut all the way through, you want to consider moving that z-axis down with each successive pass. And that's going to allow you to maintain a more ideal focal point on that laser at that impact, or excuse me, on that material at the impact point. All right, moving on to directory. You would think in Inkscape you would be able to just click a button and a file explorer would pop up and you tell it where you want to park the file. That's not the way that Inkscape extensions work in my experience. So what you need to do is bring up your folder that you actually want to put it in. I'm in Windows 10 and it doesn't show the directory here by default. If you click on this folder, it'll show you the directory, highlight it, copy it, bring Inkscape back up, and put that in there. Right click, paste, it's there. The file name is self-explanatory. I like to add .txt to the end of mine. Most G-code centers are going to open a .txt with no problem. And the reason I make it a TXT is that I like to be able to pull it up in Notepad. You can make Notepad open other character type uh, files by specifying that that is the program that you want to use to open it. But by default, Windows will open a TXT program with Notepad. So I make it easy on myself by just specifying it as such. The add numeric suffix to file name, what it's going to do is this here. Each time you create the G-code, it's just going to append you know, 001, 002, and so on. And that keeps it from freaking out whenever you try and generate a new version of the G-code and there's already a file there with this name. Live preview. I do not like to use it. I have not used it with this particular Inkscape extension, the JTEX Photonics Laser Tool. But in my personal experience using it with some other Inkscape extensions, it's caused a little bit of a problem. And it's caused some crashes, caused it to freak out and fail. I just avoid it altogether because I don't need it. So what I'm going to do is now I'll click Apply. 
and Inkscape is going to think about it for a little bit. It'll let you know that it's working, and you would expect when it finishes for it to say, uh, G code successfully output or some other notification that it's worked. The best you're going to get are these orientation points that show uh, kind of where everything is. Like this would be 0, 0 and X and Y, and this is 100 and X and Y. I want you to pay special attention to this whenever it comes up on the screen. I have noticed that in some files, you may specify this. I'm going to click on my actual vector here. That is 218 millimeters wide by 100 millimeters wide. Or excuse me, 218 wide by 100 millimeters tall. I have noticed that in some files, and I think it's some quirk with the layer setting and the SVG that it was actually designed in, it will put out something kind of crazy. It might, I'm going to just show you this as an example. It's best explained by example. Here we have the logo again in another file. When I click on this, you're going to see it's 220 wide by 100 tall. And I'm just going to go to extension. I'm going to close this. I'm going to go to extensions. I'm going to go to G, uh, generate laser G code, JTEC Photonics laser tool. I have pretty much the same parameters put in there, and I'm going to click Apply. Watch what it does. Notice how it put the orientation points out here. So it's actually calling this area right here 100 millimeters in the X direction. So if we go look at that G code that it output, you see it's trying to move a long way out here, 770 millimeters in the X direction, just to get to that first point it's going to start working on. The machine's going to crash, or you're going to end up burning up a piece of your bed. Uh, just be aware of that. I haven't pinned down exactly why that happens, but again, I think it's a quirk of the file that it was designed in. So if you just take an SVG and you open it up straight up off the internet, you might run into that, so you need to watch out. How you can avoid that, and I'm just going to close this right quick, just start a brand new SVG file. So just go to File, New, and I will close out some of this stuff here. I'm going to go back over to this file. Remember, this was the file that caused that little problem where it had the orientation point uh, way over here. So it was like X100 was here and then X700 is out here. Even though when we look up here, it was designed and dimensioned properly. What I can do is just highlight this entire thing, Control C, bring up the new Inkscape document and just paste it in. And I'm going to show you all the way through that it actually generates the correct points. First, I'm going to just make this at the X and Y point, that's going to make sure that my origin for this file is the bottom left. Now you see the border here that you're working in. It doesn't necessarily matter, but if you want to have that border fit what you're working on, you can just kind of take a mental note of your dimensions of the file, 220 by 100. I can come over here to File, Document Properties, and I'll just call that 220, 101. I want my units to be in millimeters close that and now my border kind of matches what I'm doing. Again, that does not matter for the file that it actually outputs, but if you just kind of want it to look a little better as you're working in it, uh, you could do that. may not matter to you, I just kind of have this OCD thing about that. So what will matter, what I want to emphasize, is if you bring the file in and it's over here, Okay, it might not generate the orientation points correctly. So to avoid that, I just like to make sure that my X and Y point are right here. Now again, that file, it caused a problem over here. Remember my X100 ended up here? If I were to generate that same G code where I copied and pasted it into this new SVG file in Inkscape, You'll see in a moment that it 
generates the correct orientation points. Okay, you see this is X100 now. This is about a 220 millimeter wide file, so it's correct. That's not going to happen every time, but it's a little quirk in the program that you should be aware of to prevent yourself having a bunch of a bunch of problems when you get out there to the machine and try and use a G code. I always think it's a good idea to take a look at the G code that's output just to make sure you're not going to run into any problems. So I'm going to pull this up here and just walk through. I can see it's doing just at first glance. It's doing everything it needs to here. It's got uh, M5S0 that's just turning the laser off and setting the intensity to zero. You'll find that most G-code files start out that way. G90 is just setting absolute. G21 puts me in millimeters, which is what I told it before when I was in Inkscape. This F3500 that corresponds to that travel speed parameter that I gave it. This M3 S11000 is turning the laser on and then giving it the intensity that I specified in the parameters that I set up. G4P0, the G4 is a dwell command and the P word is how long you want it to dwell. Again, we told it zero, so we know here that it's not going to dwell at all. Now the G1F500 is just telling it to move along at a feed rate of 500 millimeters per minute. That corresponds to the laser feed or the laser travel speed that we specified in the G-code parameters. So I hope that was helpful to you guys. I really encourage you to come by our website, take a look at our laser, take a look at our machines. If you don't already have one, they're an outstanding value. Customers all over the world are making great things with our machines and with our lasers. MillwrightCNC.com. Give me some feedback and let me know if you've got any questions.